Well, Shabbat Shalom and welcome to the Ark on this, the entry of the Sabbath. Are you happy to be here? Well, praise God. Yes, we welcome every single one of you on live stream, every single person who is joining us in the service tonight. Watch what God is going to do this weekend. If you come faithfully, if you come ready to worship the Lord with all that you have, watch what God will do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, uh, Pastor Tucker, for uh, opening us up, greeting the congregation and those online. We want to welcome all of you. Praise God. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Everyone who is out here, everyone who is on the other side of a screen somewhere, we're just delighted and excited to be in the house of the Lord. Many big events coming up. We are in the Passover season. We've officially passed uh, the first of the biblical new year. I'm not talking about Jewish tradition. We're talking about the one given in Exodus that said this will be the beginning of days, months for you. And then 14 days later is the Passover. We've officially crossed over into the biblical new year. Spring is, has sprung, I think. Last week we had some ice and snow, and now it's getting warmer out. Praise God. I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, new life. The birds are coming back. You know, the, the trees are going to have leaves again. The grass will turn green again. Uh, everything will follow its seasonal cycle. The flowers will bloom again. I just love spring. And um, I'm just glad because God puts things strategically in place, such as the Passover celebration, the observance of his Passover, crossing from death into life in the spring. That's where our life begins. Your life begins when the seed of God is planted in you, when you repent and when you believe and then it goes on from there. But before you can have a Pentecost, before you can have a Tabernacles, at the end of the cycle, before you can have a Trumpets, which precedes Tabernacles and Atonement, you have to have a Passover. You, you can't have a crown without a cross or a tree. Amen. You can't have an outpouring of God's Spirit. We love Pentecost. But we don't want to neglect how we got there. 
You have to have a Passover. You have to go from death into life. God is the God of the living, not the God of the dead. And God's standard of living is different than our standard of living. God's standard of living says you die to the flesh and you, you can live in the Spirit. Jesus died to His flesh, but the Spirit was alive. It resurrected Him. We're coming up on that wonderful celebration of Passover and uh, the Days of Unleavened Bread and then the Feast of first fruits. And then after that, after seven Sabbaths and one day, then we have Pentecost. But it's a joyous time to be alive, and we are rehearsing the story of God. This is not just tradition. It's not just something we do because, well, we think it's cool, and, and we're getting back to the original uh, culture of what the Lord lived and grew up in. It's not, it's not anything like that. This is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. It's the gospel story. It's the beginning of the gospel story. Amen. So God gives a new year. He gives a new biblical year. Then he gives a Passover. He says, now in this new season, this is where you go from being dead to being alive. Amen. So we're going to be uh, celebrating that really soon. April the 4th, this year, 2023, on a Tuesday, we will observe our Passover, 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. So stay tuned and uh, come and join us. The theme is the tree of death to the tree of life. Dress as casual to formal or whichever you prefer. Please wear an item of red clothing. We want to not uh, forget the blood, the blood of the Lamb. Jesus is the Lamb. And so we, we want something that is red that symbolizes the Lamb's blood. Pitch in style. Each family will bring a dish that will feed at least 8 to 10 people. If you're not able to do this, please see Sister Anna Tucker. And we will accommodate you. And if you feel led at this time, please bring your Feast of Unleavened Bread offering during this time as well, and so into the next season, Deuteronomy 16, 16 through 17 tells us. Now, we don't require this if you go to this church, but we just do it. We lead by example. My wife and I, we do this three times a year. We appear before the Lord, but we don't appear empty-handed. Unleavened bread, Pentecost, and tabernacles, we appear before the Lord and each uh, head of house does this. But we're not asking you to do anything we wouldn't do ourselves. We, we already plan for it. We always talk about it months in advance. What are we going to do for unleavened bread? What are we going to do for uh, Pentecost? What are we going to give at, at Tabernacles? And you know, I wait for the Lord to tell me an amount, and that's what we do. And it could be more, it could be less, but this is this is what we are doing and you can join us and um, sow a seed that will produce in the next season amen praise God all right speaking of giving God's a good giver and we should be good givers as well if you could please bring up the giving links just quickly go through those we have a website you can uh, get on www.revivalcenterperu.com One word, and then we have two options on there, a PayPal option and a, and a uh, Cash App option. Cash App. Money sign, Ark Peru is there, our Cash App. And then our PayPal is paypal.com slash paypalme slash A-R-C-P-E-R-U. You can give your tithe, which is the Lord's, and your offering. Do not... If you're going to give, you are going to give. And if that's all you're going to give as a person, I will always tell you, give your tithe. The tithe belongs to the Lord. Amen. You honor God, give the tithe. Offerings are above that, but the tithe is the Lord's. He's first. I will always tell you, and we will as well in our lives, give the tithe first. 
Amen. So if you're here in person, you can give in this plate here uh, to my right. If you want to write a check, make that payable to the Ark or the Revival Center. Put it in the memo box where that check uh, is to be going, be it offering tithe or special offering, whatever. If you want to give in the building fund, you can do that as well. If you're here in person, we have building fund buckets for that. That's strictly for the building fund, the upkeep of this facility. And we've got projects going on around here that we're trying and trying and trying to get done. And we're just trying to work out all the kinks. Amen. So, Father, Yahweh, in the name of your only begotten Son, full of grace and truth, the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to be like you and like him. He's a manifestation of God. We want to be like him. As he gave and didn't withhold anything, any good thing. He gave us the kingdom. He gives us everything we need. The hairs on our head, the clothes on our backs. So, Lord, we want to honor you with the tithe, and we want to honor you with the offerings, and we want to give our alms, and we want to do exactly what you ask us to do, how you say to do it. So I ask you to help these people, and bless them, and keep them. Make your face shine upon them, lift your countenance upon them, be gracious unto them, and give them your shalom. Keep us walking in covenant with you. Let the blessing of Abraham and Isaac and Israel be upon these people in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for giving. We appreciate everyone who gives online. And uh, I promise you, it helps. Everything helps. Churches are self-funded. This one is no different. Praise God. Okay. I think I got everything out of the way. Exciting time to be alive and be in the kingdom of God. But we want to continue on with our study in the last three weeks. And slowly I've been getting into this more and more. And tonight I'm going to scratch the surface because I want to be cognizant of the time. Uh, Fridays are a little more laid back. And we teach maybe preach, uh, but I, I give myself a time limit, and I try to uh, be mindful of the time on our Sabbath celebrations too, but sometimes you just want to let it all loose. But uh, this is, it's okay, I don't have to get into everything this evening, and I won't, but if you just pay attention, you're going to learn something, and possibly God will confirm some things in, in us, in you. So uh, you could bring up, and we've been in the study of the culture of the kingdom, of his kingdom. It's not our kingdom, it's his kingdom. The kingdom is within us. We didn't produce it, but we are, we're in it. He produced it, gave it to us, put it in us, put a measure of the kingdom in us. Jesus told his disciples, I'm with you, but I'm going to be in you because I'm going away. Well, he's with us in spirit form inside of us as the Holy Spirit. But there's coming a time when the kingdom is going to manifest. And I hear a lot of kingdom preachers talking about that kingdom. And we're looking forward to that because, well, uh, why we celebrate his feasts? Why do we gather at the beginning of the weekly Sabbath? We're looking forward and we do not neglect those things. But the kingdom of God is within you doesn't come with observation. It's a spiritual thing. So we've been talking about the culture of this kingdom. And mind you, the world doesn't understand this because it's not of this world. The world crucified our Messiah. Now, he laid down his life, but their hearts were still wicked and disobedient and rebellious. That's what they did. They rejected him. They beat him. They whipped him. And he let them do it. He laid down his life. And the Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Why did he do that? All so we could be brought into the original culture. We're talking about the culture of the kingdom. The one that God made from the beginning. There's a culture in heaven. 
and nothing can change it. It's set in place. It's set in order. You're not going to get God to change His standards. He says, I'm the Lord, I change not. But in the earth, we have upteen thousands, probably thousands of millions of cultures that are all trying to do the same thing in a different way. To think they're the original or uh, they were... They, they came to be from their own selves, but I want to let the people of God know we've been studying this and we've been talking about this the last several weeks. The culture, culture came from God. And there was an original culture. And last week we, we spoke about the culture of life versus the culture of death and then dominion. Life, God's culture is a culture of life. Everything God touches has life. God cannot die. You say, well, Jesus is God and he died. Jesus' body was dead, but his spirit was alive. And the grave couldn't hold his body because the spirit kept him alive. He had to become a body in order to fulfill what the first Adam did not do. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Death couldn't hold him down. So everything God touches lives. God is the source of life. This is just some review from the last few weeks. All right, bring up our scriptures. We're going to go quickly here, uh, or I'll just keep going and re-preach everything I preached before, trying to get you to understand, but you can't understand this all in one night. What I'm trying to get you to do is wake up to the understanding that God is still growing a kingdom culture and we are expected to live in it, abide by His rules and His laws, and thrive in it. If you're a Christian, you're only going to thrive in one culture. Everything else is going to produce after its kind. The culture of death is going to produce death. The culture of God's kingdom is life and life more abundantly. Exodus 20 and 1. You're going to say, I bet you, you're going to say, oh, I've never seen the Ten Commandments this way. But I found three, three divisions in the Ten Commandments. And if there's more and you're a Bible scholar, show me and we'll break it down. But I found these three and this is what, this, this is what the meat of this message is going to entail. That God spake all these words saying, I am the Lord thy God which have brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Verse 3, this is the principle. You shall have no other gods before me. Now jump on down to verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you will labor and do all your work, but the seventh is a day as the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You nor your son nor your daughter, your manservant nor your maidservant nor your cattle, your stranger that is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. You say, well, that's more than verse 8. Because the Bible wasn't written in chapter and verse, it was written in principle. Thought. Now bring up verse 12. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God gives you. This is the first commandment with promise. Honor is important in the kingdom of God. If you look out in the cultures of this world, they really have an abundant lack of honor. But honor is currency in the kingdom of heaven. Honor is something God gives and allows and trusts us with and expects us to do wisely with it. So I've broken down the Ten Commandments here into three divisions. And I'm going to be teaching on the culture of His kingdom. You've already heard some of it, some reiteration from last week. The culture of His kingdom, specifically life, I mean loving, I read my own writing. 
By the way, life comes out of love. Love produces life. Loving, remembering, and honoring. Loving, remembering, honoring. Next time you read the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, break that down. Look at it. What did Jesus say was the first and greatest commandment? Love the Lord with all your heart. Put him first, right? I want to I teach on that subject, the culture of his kingdom. And we're going to be focusing on loving, remembering, and honoring. So, Lord, Jesus, Yeshua, have your way. Holy Spirit, have your way. Make my tongue the pen of a ready writer and anoint my lips of clay. Lord, let your people hear the oracles of God and not what Joshua King thinks. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And it's not by might nor by power, but by, it's not by my power, but it's by your power, your spirit. That's what the Lord says in Jesus' name. Culture of his kingdom, loving remembering and honoring. You can break these commandments into divisions. Jesus said the greatest commandment ever written was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, body, strength, and spirit. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, we've heard it preached, and I've preached it, and I've taught it, that the Ten Commandments can be broken down into two divisions. Loving God... Loving people, having no idols, no graven images, no gods before him, not bowing yourself down to them, for he's a jealous God and he visits the iniquity upon the families who are disobedient and shows mercy, not taking his name in vain. That is part of loving God. Certain things we do and don't do because we love God. What did Jesus tell us? And what is the statement that he said? If you love me, we know this around here. We, we talk about it all the time. Keep my commandments. Because I love him, I'll keep his commandments. There's an obedience that's required of a person who is going to live and operate in this kingdom of God. And then the next list of commandments, don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness against your neighbor, don't covet your neighbor. Going back, loving God, remembering the Sabbath day, it's part of loving God, having no other gods before him. Because originally, God set forth the Sabbath as a day of rest. He woke Adam up with his breath. Adam rose up the end of the sixth day, looked at God. It was the seventh day, and then they had fellowship. From the very beginning, part of loving God. We observe Sabbath because we love God, and we love the ways of God. We don't just want the works of God. Works of God are beautiful. We love uh, speaking in other tongues. We love words of knowledge and words of wisdom. We love healings and miracles and signs and wonders. But we not only want the works of God, we want the ways of God. We want the thoughts, the ideas, the plans, the understanding of why he does what he does, what causes him to give such immeasurable love. The ways of God that are above ours. And so 1 through 8, or 1 through 4, I should say, that's verses 1 through 8, one through four is loving God, and then six through ten is loving people. Jesus said all the law and the prophets hang upon this, loving God and loving people. This is a quick, quick review. We, we found and we understood and, and came to the conclusion by study that in uh, 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, there were virtues and their values that we live by, faith and hope and love. This is just review. And we learn that faith is our operation. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hope is our destination. And the hope that God gives us is an eternal hope. And ultimately, it leads to love, which is the substance of our kingdom that we talk about. And the substance of the culture of the kingdom. And it's the transformation 
in the kingdom. A transformation inside of you. So now he's in you, in, in measure. You and I. The kingdom of God is within me. I have a measure of the kingdom and the authority and the power of God inside of me. That transforms me. Tell that which is perfect love has come. Then I won't see in part, I won't know in part, I'll see in full. Love brings life. Love produces life. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made you free from the law of sin and death. We learned in Daniel 7 and 13. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion, nothing can take his dominion. Last week's study. The kingdom of God is life and it has dominion. Life has to have dominion or God is not sovereign. Those that are with God have to live or God's a liar. God lives. And those that live, live like, look like Him, act like Him, are made in His image and made in His likeness and connected to Him have to live because He's the source of life. He cannot die. He self-exists. Can't figure it out. I can't either. I'm not even going to try. I just believe. God is. So everything that God is, is life. He's, God is love. He produces life. Life is produced through love. Love is the substance of everything God does. It brings transformation. Now, back to Exodus 20 and 1. Have Exodus 20 and 1 through, actually I said, 7. Having no other gods before him, loving the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, body, strength, spirit. Number one, this is the loving aspect of the kingdom. Remember, we, I said we were going to cover loving, remembering, and honoring. Certain values and actions that we do in this kingdom of heaven, this kingdom of God. Because love is the substance and the source, and God is love. Naturally, those that are connected with God in the same kingdom, who have a measure of it inside of them, you and I are going to have to, are going to produce love. Well, I'm a, I'm a strong, tough man. You still have to produce love. God loved, so he made you. God loved, so He saved you. God loved, so He reconciled you. God loved, so He healed you. Every part of God's kingdom will produce a measure of love. And then all the parts come together in the end of this age, and love is full. Because we cannot and I cannot contain all of God's love inside of me alone. I can't do it. I don't have the capacity to. In fact, I couldn't even love until God loved me first, healed my soul and my spirit, and allowed me to contain love so I could, it could be poured out and poured through. I was incapable of loving until God loved me. You are incapable of loving until God loves you. God gave us these Ten Commandments. We love these Ten Commandments. We fight and we protest to have these Ten Commandments put on courthouse steps. And we decree, this is the law of God. This is what we're going to live by. But yet, it's ironic that I look around and I see so much... Uh, of a lack of love in many Christians today. I'm not knocking. I love you, brother. I love you, sister. But you have to have, if you're going to be like God and God is in you, you're going to have to produce the fruit of love. There's no option. It, it happens through His Spirit. It happens by knowing His nature. Being connected to Him. 
And if you don't, I'm not so sure you're so full of God's love, God himself. So having no other gods, all the law and the prophets hang upon one of these, loving God first and loving your neighbor. Love is the substance. Love is the what transforms. The culture of God's kingdom will always reflect love. Have you ever uh, looked around or maybe perhaps been around a certain other culture? You just put a name and a people group on it and notice some of them are very hospitable. They're not perfect, but they're hospitable. Where do you think that comes from? They are trying to produce something that will be carried on throughout their generations and ages that, this, that their people group uh, lives, pass it on down the line, and so hospitality has become a major part in, the, in, in a lot of culture. Where do you think that came from? If God wasn't hospitable, he wouldn't welcome a sinner into his house. Cleanse them, pick them up from the mud and the muck. We should be the most hospitable people. I'm not talking about uh, turning our back on the principles and the truths of the, of the word of God. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about showing love by hospitality, making people feel welcome to be around us. How many unbelievers have you or I heard that said, well, I love Jesus, I love God, but I just don't like being around Christians that much. Because they seem inhospitable. The signs are all up. You can't cross this line. Well, we don't violate the word of the principles of the word of God. The law of God, that always stands. But we welcome all to come in. Check out what we got going on. God wasn't hospitable, none of us would be saved. This is the loving part. Remember, a culture is something that uh, comes from, here's the word, is C-O-L-E-R-E. It's Latin, and it means to work the soil to produce. I keep repeating that, but you have to have uh, context. And then the word culture, I guess that's how the French would say it. I haven't taken French in over 20, 23 years. <laughs> Which is a, a language de, uh, derived from Latin. That's where we get C-O-L-E-R-E, -E, to work the soil. God is working the soil, planting the seed, and growing something. Life is in things that grow. Culture is no different. God's culture was the original culture, the original template, the original blueprint. And everything else is just a replica that is trying to do what God can only do. Culture is the desire of men. This is... This is not the actual definition, but this is a principle. The desire of men to do what only God could do. It's pretty simple. God is the one that can make the perfect culture, the perfect kingdom, give perfect justice, mercy, perfect love, perfect grace. Most hospitable culture. Most fruitful culture, you notice that some uh, cultures, they only produce things that die. In fact, there have been many cultures upon this land. Again, I'm, not, I'm just speaking, it's just the word. Who have tried to do what only God could do. 
rule in power, rule in authority, and all they produced were the works of death. Then Jesus comes along and says, here's my law, here's a spirit of life. He was the fulfillment of the law. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made you now free from the law of sin and death. Therefore, death has no more dominion over you. In Jesus' culture, the one that he came bringing, the culture of the kingdom, is the only one that could produce real, true life. Every other, it ended, it faded away, it brought about the works of death. So when that wasn't working, then they would try to absorb others into themselves through warfare and more death and more destruction. Now you know the devil's version of culture. Stealing, killing, and destroying. You know, the original lie in the garden was that you will be as gods, knowing good and evil. In fact, there's a philosophy in the world just like this, and I'm not going to name it, but just do a little study, that says you're a god within yourself. You don't have to listen to anybody. And all of this while God gave them a perfect environment, a perfect place, a perfect habitation, a perfect culture that God was growing and said, Now here, Adam, here, Eve, you are the first. Carry on this new way. You go be fruitful and you multiply. That's the promise of life. Replenish, fill the earth with the culture of this Kingdom of God, I've given you every tool at your disposal. I've given you every power and every ability. I've given you the authority. Go take dominion. And someone comes along saying, you don't have to do that. God's trying to hide something from you because what you lack is this that he has. And I've got it. I want to introduce it to you. And that's exactly what he did. They believed the lie that they were God's. They were their own God. And still thought they could be fruitful and multiply and do God's mission and do God's bidding, but yet they were a little more wise. And the opposite was true. While the serpent promised them they would be as gods, they gave their dominion over to him. And so then, the one who had dominion in the earth, which is originally supposed to have been Adam, the master, under God, the Lord, the husbandman of the earth, gives his duties, responsibilities, his authority and power to a serpent, and then the serpent becomes the master, and the husbandman of the earth now is the slave. You see, the lie... And believing the lie that you'll be as gods and you will be and being your own God does not free you or bring you and I liberty. It only changes who's our master. It only changes who's master. Who who is the master of us? And if you love God and God's love is in you, you know who your master is. And you'll know when there's anything opposite or contrary to love that tries to rise up in us when we meet with an obstacle or a situation we don't fully understand. And that thing that tries to rise up and say, here's a good idea. Here's some vengeance. Why don't you go and act vengeance? In fact, they've got it coming and they deserve it. Every man will be accountable for their own sin. Doesn't the word say that? God says love them. Love them because love is part and the substance of this culture. If you're going to be in the culture of God's kingdom, you're going to have to learn to love. 
Praise the Lord. We've mentioned over the last few weeks that culture is, a, is the knowledge, belief sets, the morality, the laws, the customs, and the cuisine of a particular group of people that is uh, pervade onto the next generation and the next generation and passed down. You see, the Lord never meant for His culture to end at Eden. It was to fill the whole earth and consistently and constantly reflect heaven. When we try to do it any other way, we don't love God first. We don't put God first. We make, an, we make a graven image out of our own thoughts. Any other culture that is contrary to God's kingdom culture is a graven image built off of the thoughts and the wisdom of a man who is imperfect. Now that's not saying that uh, you hate every aspect of a different... I'm not, I'm not saying that. I love people. I'm saying whatever is contrary to the will, the word, the law of God is built off of imperfect man's thoughts and it's a graven image. That's why we try to do things according to the word of the Lord in the Ark of Peru. Notice the governments of men will say, what are you doing? You're not respecting. That's hate speech. It's their new thing. That's hate speech. You can't say that about them. And whatever them is does nothing but produce death, destruction, and are known for that around the world, but you can't say nothing about it because it's hate speech. But while those governments of men are saying, you can't say that, you can't do that, you can't liken them to that, that's hate speech, they will bring down their hand of whatever measure of authority they think they have and subjugate that same people. And try to bring them into their way of thinking, their way of doing, their way of seeing. And if not, they'll bring war, destruction, and chaos to their, them. You can't even get honesty. Full truth and honesty and transparency from any other culture except the kingdom of heaven of God. Love God first. Because we love Him, we keep His commandments. Because we love Him, we follow the law. It's written on our hearts. Because we love Him, we put Him first. Because we love Him, we propagate Him and His kingdom and His culture first. It's what we live. It's what we do. It's where we go. And when they say you got to shut your mouth or you got to shut your doors because there's some kind of pandemic going on, we don't do it because we love God and would rather obey God over men. Do as the Lord says, because we are in a different culture. The world system does not understand this. They can't because it's spiritually discerned. It's your loyalty. Everything is based off of how a person feels. You noticed in the present age, it's becoming more prevalent in our society to base truth or a version of truth off of how you feel at the time. Gender. Well, I feel like a zebra today. I think I'll be a zebra and you can't tell me I'm not a zebra. It doesn't matter if my DNA doesn't say I'm a zebra. It doesn't matter if my DNA says sign Jesus Christ. I'm a zebra today, 
So you go eat a lot of grass and tell me how that comes out. In fact, why don't you go run with the herd, paint yourself black and white, put some fake hooves on, go run with the herd, make zebra noises, live like a zebra and see how well you keep up with the herd. I'm just using that as an example. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And if he came in his Father's name, speaking his Father's words, doing his Father's deeds, and giving us the way, the truth, and where real life is, I'm going to have to do after him if I expect to. If, if I expect to be successful. I will not be a very successful zebra. I can't run that fast. You know, a zebra has to run through and swim across a crocodile-infested creek. We build a bridge or jump or fly over it or shoot the crocodile and put it on the wall or something. You know? A zebra doesn't. They get eaten. There's no standard of truth in the world anymore. Every culture has their own truth, but God's remains the same. The way, the truth, and the life. You're not going to have life unless it's this way. You're not going to even find the way unless it's this way. You can't find truth unless it's this way. And we have to be willing to stand up and know that God gave His kingdom culture dominion. His plan was to have dominion. Daniel 7 and 13, what Adam failed to do, Jesus Christ Finished, Daniel 7 and 13, God gave him a kingdom that was an everlasting kingdom, everlasting dominion that would rule and have preeminence over the entire earth and in heaven. In fact, Jesus' kingdom is even in heaven. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So that's why he gave him a name, because the name is what a king has. And so when your king goes and conquers, he has a name. Well, this king's coming. He says that name is above every name. So every other culture, every other God, every other name has to bow, has to come under the authority that is in that name. God gave him dominion and said, it doesn't matter if they call it hate speech and you call out their wicked deeds. It, you stand up for truth. You stand up for righteousness. You stand up for life. You stand up for the way. You stand up for the name. And you love God first. Amen. Exodus 20 and 8 says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. In this culture, we're talking about loving and remembering. Now, I didn't get into everything, and I'm not going to tonight. Remembering the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Why is it so important to, for God to uh, tell His people to give them a day where they would remember something that is important to God? Part of a culture is its custom. Part of a culture is his morality and its laws. And there's a law that was given to us to remember the Sabbath day. It's important to God. We remember it because it's important to God. We don't receive the benefits or blessings that come from being a part of this kingdom culture that has dominion and is a culture of life without doing, acting, being, and remembering what is important to God. You say, well, that cancels grace. By grace are you saved through faith. That's the truth. You are saved by grace through faith. But faith will bring obedience. Faith will allow you to believe the Word of God and follow the way. And then you'll find the truth. He will guide you when the Comforter has come. He will guide you into all truth. 
And through that, you'll get life. Jesus was pretty exclusive when he made that statement. So what do we do to honor? We remember the things Scripture tells us to keep it holy. It's always been holy to God, but he's telling you to make it holy to you. God only presents what's holy to him to you if he trusts you with it. And he knows you have the ability to keep it holy. We're talking about God's culture, his kingdom. It's an exclusive club, but everybody's invited. But there's some laws, some guidelines, and some parameters we have to follow and that we get to follow because everything else is that has ever been outside of it has produced nothing but the works of death and has brought no life. You know, humans have found ways to clone. But there's no life to clone. Based out of and formed from something that was originally alive, whose DNA was, or RNA, or the structure of life in this, or the code of life in, in whatever they, or whoever they're cloning. That was given by something greater and more powerful, God. That's why it's a clone. You ever noticed? This is, you're going to like this. You ever noticed? Jesus said that the truth is that light has come into the world, but men love darkness because their deeds were evil. So God set forth from the very beginning. He said, let there be light. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And guess what? You are too. Light was the life of men. The light shined in the darkness. The darkness did not comprehend it or overcome it. Ever noticed that? The systems of this world that mimic. Now this all came from somewhere. Remember, you'll be as gods for knowing good and evil. This is where every other culture, contrary to the word of God, came from. That's its root. You'll be as gods knowing good and evil. You're going to do what God does and be like God. And what's it produced? Nothing but death. So God, in, a, in essence... His life is ever living, ever knowing, ever present. Put it into the ground, the field. The seed is the word of God. The word of God went into the ground. He formed a man. He brought him to life. Man was in his image and his likeness. And when we follow in the footsteps of Jesus, we become in Jesus' image. And he's the image and the express image of God. And we become in his likeness again. That's why we need to know his ways. That's his likeness. Heart, his spirit. What makes him go. Why he does what he does. And so here we are in these uh, science labs producing clones off of something that's already alive. Trying to do what God already did in the beginning and be just like God. The original lie from the beginning. You'll be as God's knowing good and evil. You can produce something that looks like something that was alive. God was alive. He produced a son out of himself that looked like him. And so now they're trying to produce a clone off of something that's already living and be like God. But it lacks the essence of life. It wasn't formed. You see this example? Do you see, do you understand this example? It wasn't formed from love, it was formed from knowledge. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's not real life. Its root is in another culture. 
Every seed will produce after its kind. And anything rooted in the culture of the knowledge of good and evil will produce the knowledge of good and evil and produce death as it always has. So why do we remember what God keeps holy? And why do we remember what's important to Him? And why do we hold on to our Bible? Why do we hold on to those Ten Commandments? Because we remember! And we keep what's holy to God, holy to us. You're set apart and you're holy unto the Lord. What's important to Him should be important to you. Couple minutes. Another observation of the current culture. Remember, I said that these cultures that are contrary to the Word of God, every culture that is, there's always something contrary to the Word of God. You know, the Aztecs and the Mayas used to haul people to the top of the pyramid of the sun god and rip out their hearts and cut off their heads as a sacrifice. God said, all souls are mine, and if you murder, you're worthy of death. Do not murder. Say, well, God told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. Well, why don't you study that out a little more? Isaac lived. There's a whole lot more than that, but all of these cultures produce death. Romans produce death, destruction, conquering other nations. The same spirit is, a, is, is working in the world today. Notice, when something offends this generation, they want to tear it down. They want to tear down the statues. That sounds a lot like every other culture for the last 6,500 years. Tear down the statues. Wipe out the remembrance of their traditions, their values, their customs. And reign and rule over them. Always keeping your thumb on them. It's the same spirit produces the same fruit after its kind and is rooted in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the works that bring death. And we need to hold on to what God says is important. We need to hold on to His truth. We need to stay in the way. We need to stay in real, true life. And remember. Dominion was never given. To anyone but those who were with God. You don't read anywhere in the Word where the Lord said, Okay, serpent. Now you have the whole... No, you don't, he didn't have dominion. He had, had control. Adam gave his dominion away, but the serpent didn't get his dominion. Death had dominion over man's uh, life. So now death was produced. Because they went after another set of values, another set of laws, another way, different thoughts, partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and dominion was found no other place but inside the culture that God was growing and started in the earth. Full dominion wasn't even given to the serpent or the adversary. 
Jesus was the lamb slain and is the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. He's always had dominion. Once it's finished in spirit, there ain't no changing it. There's no getting around it. There's no other way that can be more powerful or possess more authority. It's settled. Humanity lost dominion. Jesus regained and has always held dominion, but gave. Now he's bringing dominion back to the sons of God. And will rule and reign. And show the world what it was really like to be under the rule of God. I find in one place in the scripture where the Lord says, nothing in my holy mountain will die. Nothing. Amen. Praise God. All right, I'm going to stop there. That's a good stopping point. No, maybe it seems abrupt, but looking at the time, and I feel like uh, the Lord wants me to just bring that to a close. Remember, we've talked about loving the substance of the kingdom, remembering, we remember, other cultures don't remember, other cultures, when they get offended, when they want to do what they want to do, uh, this is just rehashing, they want to tear statues down, they want to label uh, people as racists and homophobes, and they want to label them as bigots, and they want to, they're producing the same fruit after their kind as has always been produced from 6,500 or more years ago. From the culture of death. It's not changed. It's not a new enemy. It's not a new uh, adversary. Nothing has changed. It's the same spirit. It's still Antichrist. Why they don't want your kids in school to remember the founding of this nation. You have nothing to remember. You have nothing that you came from. You were produced. You don't know who you are. You have no identity. God's built, God's creating this culture, and there's an identity that comes along with it, and all who are in it will have an identity that reflects Him. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for this word. Thank you for life. Thank you for love, for peace, for grace. Lord, bring us back together tomorrow again. Lord, make us more like you. Produce in us the fear of the Lord. Grow it in us, Lord. Teach us to remember and to love. Christ's name. Amen, amen. Lord, let that woman named Donna, I don't know who she is, where she's at, let her be touched right now. God, meet her right where she's at. Meet her right where she's at. You're tugging and pulling on her heart. That's the name you just gave me. Just tug and pull on her heart. God, pull her cords of love. Remember her, God. Amen. We will see you all tomorrow at 11 a.m. where we'll be live streaming again. Uh, we'll start prayer at 1030. Of course, I'll be here earlier than that. Want to stop on by 307 Wampler Street in Peru, Indiana? We'd be uh, pleased and love to have you. In Jesus' name, go in peace and shalom.